Sparkling on the Idaho-Utah border is a lake bathed in bold shades of blue. We sit and listen to people and hear them drive into town and go, why is it so blue? How does a lake look like that? It just never stops amazing people. This amazing place is Bear Lake with its supply of weekend fun for families. It's just become kind of a gathering place for our family. I can't think of a better place to be. And it's fertile ground for farmers. While the nature-made reds and blues of the lake are what make it so famous, that notoriety comes with a monster of a tail. It was made up by a local to get people to come to Bear Lake. <laughs> But long before recreation graced these shores, irrigation and industry dropped anchor here. The complicated ream of century-old regulations, which include hydropower as a residual bonus, make Bear Lake essentially a holding tank. Storage water sits on top of natural intake. Bear Lake is a multitasking workhorse with demands coming from a wide range of users in several counties across multiple states. And the wear and tear of such buried work is starting to show. It looks so tranquil and well, but there is trouble brewing over the long haul if, if we don't manage well. As water levels decrease and vacationing crowds increase, Bear Lake's value becomes as rare as its color. It's beautiful. How could you not like something as gorgeous as Bear Lake? Outdoor Idaho dives into the bluest water you'll find in the West. Bear Lake, the Caribbean of the Rockies. Funding for Outdoor Idaho is made possible by the Friends of Idaho Public Television, by the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore's legacy of helping to build the great state of Idaho, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Fur trappers in 1818 referred to this as Black Bear's Lake, an otherwise stuffy government report compared it to an emerald among the mountains. Of course, it was also known as U.S. Reservoir Number 1, by none other than Geological Survey Director John Wesley Powell. Hi, I'm Bruce Reichert, and welcome to Outdoor Idaho. And that helps explain some of the complexities surrounding this beguiling body of water, a remarkable blend of hydrology and geology. It's springtime in southeastern Idaho. River is rich with runoff. Fertile fields are fortified with its liquid nourishment. There is more than enough water to start the growing season. Spring rains add to the flow with intense showers that darken the sky and squall across Bear Lake County. But the water farmers rely on runs low in late summer. So the Bear River is diverted in the spring when runoff is high. Diverted water stored for those not so rainy days later on. Storage water filters through marshland near Montpelier then reaches its temporary holding place, Bear Lake. I remember as a child coming into this valley and thinking the lake was painted in like color by the number and somebody used kind of the wrong color, but it was so pretty and I've been fascinated with the color ever since. It drives you back. You get up and you look at it and it makes the day okay. The lake's well-known blue is the result of limestone in the surrounding mountains. Much of what's in Bear Lake is groundwater. 
And as it passes over the limestone, calcium carbonate, which is white, dissolves, reflecting the natural blue color of water. Think of it as a big bathtub of tongues. It's beautiful and, and we have many stakeholders that we work with to make sure it does stay pristine and blue and clean and so we work hard to keep it that way. Bear Lake is 208 feet deep. Most of it is natural and has been for centuries. But the top 21 feet is man-made. And that's where all the diverted river water is stored for 150,000 acres of irrigated farmland. Pushing water into Bear Lake in early spring and pulling it back out in late summer is also a power generator. The deal forged 100 years ago means Bear Lake is one of the nation's rare hybrids, part lake, part reservoir. And it also means that those who love it keep close watch on how it's used for work and for play. We love it. I mean, you don't invest your life savings here if you're not gonna love it. So. It looks so tranquil and well, but there is trouble brewing over the long haul if, if we don't manage well. Part of that management is a multi-state effort for Bear Lake's fishery. Idaho and Utah both are involved in helping native Bonneville cutthroat trout. It's not just an us or them. We all work together for the resource and people that have the ranches and stuff that irrigate. Unmarked. They view it as very important too because they see the importance of these fish and they don't want those fish to ever become endangered or listed or anything on their watch. So they've been willing to work with us and, and we encourage that and, and we reach out to them and, and they reach out to us. In the spring, the biggest trout run up the smallest streams to spawn. It doesn't matter what size the tributaries are, I've seen them come up even little drainage ditches that are coming into the lake, and they're good sized fish. Six to seven pounders are common. 10 to 12 pounders are a treat. Every fish gets a good gawking and a tag. I never get sick of seeing those fish. 32, to see the color and the size of those fish, 32.86 is just amazing to me. Eggs are collected from some, Others are sent upstream to do their thing naturally. 588, the cutthroat trout fishery is really valuable. 2256. It's the native sport fish that we have here in Bear Lake. Upstream, unmarked. Landowners, government agencies, and groups like Trout Unlimited cooperate to improve the lake's tributaries. A decade of their restoration work is finally showing results. New screens keep fish out of fields and culverts keep waterways connected so trout can reach their spawning grounds. The improvements are working so well that the lake isn't stocked with Bonneville cutthroat trout anymore, and in 2015, wild fish outnumbered hatchery fish for the first time. I enjoy my job, <laughs> I can honestly say that. There's a lot of people out there that, that maybe don't look forward to going into work. I do, and I feel I'm making a difference, especially for these cutthroat trout in Bear Lake. 686. After spawning, the cutties quickly swim back to the lake to feast on summer's underwater buffet. That happens just about the time the tourists show up on the beach. People along the Wasatch Front from Salt Lake all the way northward in Idaho recreate up here. And so we have some sleepy little towns of Garden City and Lake Town and Fish Haven, Idaho and St. Charles that might have a couple hundred people in them during the week. And on the weekends, Garden City can swell to several tens of thousands of people. Summertime, start seeing the traffic, it comes a little more, a little more, and all of a sudden Memorial Day, and then there's lots of people here. <laughs> And I like that, it's exciting to me. I love sharing things that are cool and Bear Lake's one of those. And I figure the more people that love Bear Lake, the more people are gonna help protect Bear Lake. Visitors come for fun, and they come for family. Ah. Bear Lake is different from other resort communities. 
People here often think, well, Bear Lake's going to turn into another Jackson Hole or Park City, but that will never happen. Bear Lake is just completely about families. People come here primarily to spend time with their families. The aroma of percolating camp coffee and sizzling greasy bacon infiltrate the traditional campgrounds. French toast is delicious. And the fancier summer homes dotting 48 miles of shoreline. A happy medium between rough and fancy is also popping up on the shoreline. Glamour camping, or glamping. The idea is you get the camping experience without all the headache and a lot more comfort. You just show up and you have fresh linens and a bed, but you're sleeping in a tent and you have a campfire. Now I love to camp and I love to rough it, but not everybody does, so. Glamping provides the fun part of camping with the ease of a hotel. I'm sold on glamping. I think it's a great addition to Bear Lake. We did some tent camping years back, and I would say this is a definite upgrade. <laughs> Upgrades include posh canvas tents with plumbing and covered wagons with power. They are all circled in quaint order on 18 acres that used to be a cow pasture. The old saying in Bear Lake that you used to hear is, if you're going to go to Bear Lake, take a sleeping bag and a sandwich. There's no place to sleep and no place to eat. And of course, that's changing, and this is part of that change. We have both places to sleep and places to eat. And eat, they do. Okay, there's two of your raspberries. Diners and drive-ins enjoy lines of customers on summer nights. Raspberry shakes are the area's top seller. People come to Bear Lake for the raspberry shake. Raspberries are a great story up here, and I don't know exactly how they started, but I remember as a child, we'd come and you'd bring your own stuff and pick your own raspberries, and it was such a delight. Three cases out, huh? Roger Early loves the berries' popularity. Put them in the back here. He's one of the handful of raspberry farmers left that's still growing Bear Lake's special variety of raspberry called Camby. They're a sweet, nice berry, and they come on just at the right time when Oregon berries and Washington berries are slowing up, and then they fill in the gap. Bear Lake's cool nights and warm days are ideal for raspberries. Early's eight pickers pluck 50 flats a day, Seven and a half acres of red sweetness, all picked by hand, no machine. These berries are very sensitive and the machine kind of mashes them up. Early sells his berries whole, but other growers mash for syrup, jelly, and of course those famous Bear Lake raspberry shakes. You'll talk to people and they just drove over the hill from Logan just to see the lake and get their shake and turn around and go home. And there's something else that draws visitors over the hill, Minnetonka Cave, a cave of nine rooms clustered in a half mile stretch about 40 minutes northwest of Bear Lake. Staggered staircases and strategically placed lights help cave visitors navigate the dampness where constant moisture keeps gleaming stalactite and stalagmite formations growing. Some of the formations resemble spaghetti-like straws and ribbons of bacon. More than 20,000 people see Minnetonka's dark depths in the summer. But the cave, while famous, doesn't carry folklore status like the Bear Lake monster. Throughout history, there are numerous accounts of the legendary beast. Indians described a serpent-like creature. It was later spotted near scout camp, swimming faster than a horse could run. It's often described as one large hump with smaller humps following. But naysayers don't buy the lore. It might be spilling the beans, but my operators said that they've noticed in the morning that they see moose go out into the water 
and have the mother go out with her little calves behind her and swim in the water and play in the water. And so if you think about it, if you think about a moose head and then the mother's back and then the little babies, I think you could uh, make a case that that's probably the source of that, that legend. <laughs> a more tangible and more visible worry at Bear Lake creeps on the beach. It's called Phragmite, an invasive weed rapidly spreading its tentacles across the sand. It will take over the beach. We won't be able to get down here. So that's very immediately pressing because you can't just allow that to sit. Something that has to be addressed now. Bear Lake Watch formed in the early 1990s, right about the time more people started showing up and the water started shrinking. The watch wanted an independent voice. It's not like you can just do it in the community council because the people aren't here. They're in Salt Lake, they're in Idaho Falls, they're in Logan, they're in all over, they're out of state, they're in Wyoming. Somewhere we've got to have a way to bring them all together to be able to participate in what goes on here. Otherwise, this just becomes a big tub of water that will be used right now for irrigation. It would become drinking water. The lake itself wouldn't matter unless people stand up and say, yes, the lake matters. It's not just irrigation. Coddle cleans up the beach by her place on the Idaho side of the lake on a daily basis. However, her neighbors, summer renters, are not as polite. Yeah, there's driving on the beach and then there's being stupid. Yeah, that's an issue here. With so much of this wild open space, people just think they can do anything they want on it. You have the whole state's people coming here. You have one little tiny county that has to try to manage that. And that's a difficult thing. You know, our sheriff can barely keep up on a normal day without coming down here. Bear Lake Watch is the lake's watchdog. The group works with cabin owners, irrigators, the power company, and state agencies. Creating a management plan for a lake that straddles two states with users coming from several more is no easy or short-term endeavor. You look at the lake, you look at the people enjoying the lake, and you think what will happen if nobody does that. We're sitting a long ways from where the high water should be. We should be sitting with about four feet of water over our head. We should be under the sea. So you can see there's a lot of land that gets left behind. And these great little waves that are making this little bit of beach, they are what should make the beach all year round at the high water mark and keep the lake bed clean of invasive plants and weeds. And that's not happening. We have a lot of support from Boise, even though a lot of people haven't been here yet. But they can't fathom what you're talking about when you're saying we have trouble with people driving on the beach. I mean, they think Coeur d'Alene. They have no idea. What, what do you mean they drive on the beach? <laughs> you know, until you've been here and you see these expanse and you see that, yeah, that's a problem, but it's also, it's our only way to get here. You can't get grandma and grandpa out to the beach if you don't drive them. At this point, our issues are just so different from anything anywhere in the Northern Lakes. All the rules are written for the Northern Lakes. So we've not been able to really adapt a management plan, rules, and laws that, that fit Bear Lake. Fortunately for Cottle, summertime pressure eases when the leaves turn. Fall is better than summer because it's so quiet and the weather is still very nice. Fairly often we get an Indian summer. September is usually gorgeous and October often is. Uh, you know, fall is the best time. It's just wonderful. You know, of course, the colors and the lake's still beautiful. And the colors around Bear Lake are some of the best in the West, with bold reds and blazing yellows. We get the beautiful change of color in the hills.
the reds and the oranges and the hills just become beautiful. The grains ripen, the grasses are all, you know, beautiful and flowing and we can go clear into October and be on the lake. It can still really be beautiful. It gets quiet, it gets quiet. By November, the cold sets in with a vengeance and the ice dominates Bear Lake country. In the winter, it could be lonely if that kind of thing bothered you. And you live a lot with the birds and you pay a lot more attention to the wildlife. The silence breaks for 10 days in January. It's pretty quiet in the winter, except for the Cisco run. <laughs> when word gets out that the Cisco went in, the fishermen come in pretty heavy. This is the only place in the world where you can catch Bonneville Cisco. There we go. There you go. It's a whitefish species that rarely grows beyond seven inches. Got a triple scoop. Those are the Cisco. And stays in deep water except for a brief spawning season in the winter. I think I just hit a honey hole there for a minute. You walk out into about knee deep water and you have your dip net. And you set it out in front of you and you just watch, watch and wait and you see these little black, like little pencils sliding through the water and you just do what you can to scoop them up. It's once a year that we get to celebrate these fish. Yeah, baby. One. <laughs> the Cisco are a unique fish and they come in to spawn at this time of the year and you only have this narrow window of opportunity for people to see these fish right up along the shoreline. And so we're here to not only let the people see the fish and try to dip net fish, but also to come over here and hook up with family and friends and just enjoy ourselves and, and eat some fish, eat some Cisco, eat some scones, and just enjoy it in the middle of winter. Cabin fever, this solves it. <laughs> While anglers net buckets of fish at the Cisco Disco on the east side of the lake, this water is 33 degrees this morning, a balmy 33 degrees. <laughs> Swimmers shake off cabin fever with a polar plunge on the west side. One, let's go! Oh man, oh man! The barely covered and costume clad plungers are in and out of the water in seconds. Are you ready, Flintstone? No. no. <laughs> All right. One, two, three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the fishermen, bundled in many layers, last long enough to catch breakfast. Yeah, it's cold. It's solid. It's really cold. I can't feel my feet anymore, so. Winter waders can warm up with a fish fry right on the beach. They're fairly mild fish, a white meat. They're small, so it takes a few of them to make a meal. And I like the way they cook them up here at the Cisco Disco, where they use a, a cornmeal type batter and deep fry them. They're really good. Mm. It's fun because you can use the net and it's fun because the Cisco are yummy. Biologists believe there are more than 7 million Cisco in Bear Lake. 26, 28, 29. The daily catch limit is 30. One more. <laughs> and just like in the summer, winter at Bear Lake is a family affair. I'm wearing um, waders and 
Alright, you want to warm up a little bit? <laughs> My grandma's shoes that she doesn't wear. Bear Lake is that rock for so many families, and it is for ours. You know, it's the place people just come to for that peace. It's such an intense part of people's family. I, I hope that continues for people. We've invested here because we want that for all of our kids and our grandkids. We want this to be their rock, regardless of where they live, where they go in the country, and, and that they'll be able to come back here. And this will always be that place of tranquility. Hopefully. Funding for Outdoor Idaho is made possible by the Friends of Idaho Public Television, by the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore's legacy of helping to build the great state of Idaho, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. All Outdoor Idaho programs are available for purchase, including hour-long specials. To find more information about these shows, visit us at idahoptv.org.